Today is entitled Landscapes of Longevity, Healthy Aging Across the World. I'm Marcia Day Childress. I'm with the UVA Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, which brings you this weekly Medical Center Hour series. In the summer of 2013, two graduate students in landscape architecture at UVA, Harriet Jamison and Asa Eslocker, traveled to Sardinia, Okinawa, and Loma Linda, California. Residents of these locales enjoy some of the longest life expectancy in the world. But why? Persons in these places have long been studied for their genetics, their diets, their recreation habits. But Ms. Jameson and Mr. Eslocker turned their lens, literally as you'll see, on the places themselves, exploring the peculiar physical, spatial, and material qualities, such as topography, plant communities, urban forms, and also inquiring into the elderly residents' personal attachments to these cultural landscapes. No one had ever before inquired into or demonstrated in these settings the critical role that place might play in healthy longevity. Through study of these distinctive landscapes and the personal stories of elderly residents, the students arrived at insights that may help communities redesign public landscapes to cultivate a culture of health and well-being that spans infancy through old age. We're very pleased to have Ms. Jameson and Mr. Eslocker presenting their landmark work at this Medical Center Hour. Their work helps us to see that health does not originate in, nor does it find its continuance only within healthcare systems, but that there are important ways in which health is sustained beyond healthcare, including in and where, in where and how. <coughs> Both Harriet and Asa are now on the School of Architecture faculty as lecturers and directors of projects within the school. Not only will we learn from them in this hour about how a sense of place can contribute to one's health and well-being, but we're also allowed to preview parts of their full-length documentary film, Landscapes of Longevity. This is something of a sneak preview. They have just learned this week that the film will premiere at the November Virginia Film Festival. They also learned this week that they are the recipients of the 2014 Honor Award for Student Research from the American Society of Landscape Architects. I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the partnership of the Center for Design and Health in the School of Architecture uh, for this program. And there should be some good time for a discussion with them after their presentation. So, um, Harriet and Asa, it's all yours. Thank you, Marsha. Hello, my name is Harriet Jameson, and I'm a lecturer in the Architecture School and the Program Director for the UVA Community Design Research Center. Thank you so much for having us here today. And my name is Asa Eswalker, and I'm currently a lecturer and director in special projects at the School of Architecture as well. And uh, this is the beginning of our documentary film, Landscapes of Longevity, and today we've deconstructed it, uh, especially for you all, uh, for a more interactive presentation. So we hope you what does it take to live a long, healthy life? As we age, what elements are important not only to living long, but also feeling alive. But the more friends you make, the happier your life, the longer you last. So the landscapes of longevity research set out to look at three distinct places, from our perspective, three cultural landscapes 
that are characterized by high rates of life expectancy to ask really what role does place have on health? And to highlight the spatial turn uh, within the health sciences within these places. We visited Loma Linda, California, which is east of Los Angeles, the central highlands of Sardinia, and then Okinawa, which is the southernmost island uh, of Japan. It's actually closer to Taiwan. These are the three places. But first, we need to understand this basic question that we feel most people don't quite understand. It's just so simple, and it's one of the reasons why we're here today. What is health? This is uh, presumably your field. Uh, <laughs> we are designers, and uh, we would like to hear from you. When somebody says, what is health, what do you say? Anybody? Just speak up. We're going to have different moments here. Anybody? So, a sense of well-being. Okay. A sense of well-being, a sense of wholeness, and, and uh, holistically uh, approach. So not just physical. But, uh, Health is physical. a sense of well-being. Exactly. <laughs> a sense of Perfect answer. Psychological Thank and you. spiritual. And all of those factors are important. In light of the U.S. health disadvantage, medical experts are urging for new understandings of health based on physical and mental balance and proactive lifelong wellness. That's that's my orchard. <laughs> but what health is not is simply the absence of disease. Furthermore, it has become widely accepted that landscape and place are vital to health. I see that very, very frequently. In the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, we understand the importance of the impact of the environment on health. Not only the health of uh, humans, but also the health of ecosystems and, and our entire planet. Where one lives, and how one uses the environment has profound health implications. That's a Meyer lemon. <laughs> so our conceptual uh, framework begins with salutogenic design, which is grounded in biomedicine and psychology, and it addresses the root of an unhealthy society rather than just... What we need needs. today desperately is salutogenic design. It's design that actually encourages health for example, a, a stairway that's very prominent, that's beautifully designed, that would attract your attention to use the stairs, we can design an environment that just invites us to exercise as part of our uh, daily routine. In order to do this, we set out to research and analyze three cultural landscapes of extraordinarily high life expectancy, the people in them, and the connections that these people feel to the places in which they live. And so, we'd like for you to take a quiet moment of reflection and think about a place to which you are deeply attached. This could be a room in your childhood home, or a space in your garden, or your church. For me, it's my parents' farm in Tennessee. What does this place look like? Smell like? What does it feel like? What emotions does it evoke in you? Who is there? And we'd like for you to take a minute and share this with your neighbor. This is the interactive part. <laughs> <laughs> share it with your neighbor. So maybe somebody next to you, I'd open up and uh, practice that good bedside uh, manner. And share it with your neighbor. Place that are meaningful to you. We have about three minutes.
Would anyone mind sharing with me about either your a place that you have a special connection to? Or your neighbors? So this sand and the water meeting and you're on land but you can be so close to the water and this seems to be all the elements of the earth right there. Mm -hmm. That's contribute to the idea of sense of place. So sense of place and rootedness are ways of describing place attachment. It's an important component of our research. Questa è la mia azienda, le mie pecore, le, eh, il mio respiro, ecco, sono questi alberi. Mm -hmm. 
vita bisogna saperla anche prendere. Here we see that place is experienced subjectively. Just as stories are passed down from a personal point of view. And in many ways, this is the data in our research. This is narratology. This is narrative ethnographic research. So the use of narrative and storytelling in this research helped to reveal these seniors' lived daily experiences, connections to their landscape, that helped us unlock these qualitative clues about their health and well-being and uh, also the formation of identity and the formation of their communities. So this is the Johnson Day. They always breathe a sigh of relief. We've made it this far again. <laughs> From now on, it's easy going. We treasure every, every orange pool that we find. And so uh, here, one of the final points is Holder Crooks Park. And it's a landmark that celebrates longevity, and it celebrates this woman, Holder Crooks who between the ages of 65 and 91 scaled 97 peaks. Wow. Now she's an inspiration, of course, to those who think that they're too old to, uh, to learn how to be healthy. So these narratives uh, not only show us their physical routine, their physical walk, but also their emotional um, connection to their community in these different places. And this next vignette is from a 91-year-old Giovanni Luigi Biscu in Oliena. Sono nato a Oliena nel 1923. In Sardinia, many seniors here rely on traditional physical routines as the foundation for health and well-being. Sono Ortolano Contadino. Ho fatto anche il pastore. Io mi alzo molto presto la mattina e vado in campagna verso le sei. Giovanni used to walk nearly four miles to his fields. But now at age 91, he enjoys the steep streets sunrise from the comfort of his daily commute. Down the slope from Oliena, a patchwork of small-scale family farms dots the base of the Supermonte Mountain. For Giovanni, his work routine is more than just about providing food for his family. It is physically empowering and rewarding. Quanto? 20 kg. 20 kg. And his connection to the land, to his food, and other living processes are vital to his long, healthy life. <laughs> E sanno anche l'alimento che, che ti produciamo noi stessi. Fico. Fico, sì. Se la vuoi mangiare? Sì, prendila. Grazie. Tutte cose che allungano la vita, 
e confortano la vita. But his work in the landscape also gives him purpose and deep satisfaction. Questo terreno mi aiuta nella vita, nella moralità, nel lavoro, in tutte, in tutte le cose mi aiuta, perché io lavoro un po' troppo. Perché se mi fermo sono perduto. Giovanni's active daily routine is good for his well-being in more ways than just his physical or cardiovascular health. Now scientists are beginning to understand the complex connections between physical and psychological well-being related to being outside and stimulated in the public places, parks, and neighborhoods where we live. So unfortunately, not all of us can be like Giovanni, the shepherd and farmer in the Sardinian Highlands. In order to translate this research into lessons for our contemporary cities, we needed to compare and analyze it with our public spaces in the US. So we have another vocabulary quiz for you. What is public space? What is public? Anyone? Share, share, read all. Everyone? Accessible. Share. Accessible. Share. Anyone else? This is also public. Yeah. <laughs> the narrative of loss of public space isn't just about the mid 20th century neglect, but also the kind of reinvestment that happened. So a lot of money went into a different kind of public space, infrastructure for roads that allowed you to drive quickly from suburbs into the city, and this investment in tree-lined sidewalks and the small kind of public spaces that would have been part of your everyday walk generation before. So by the 60s, you saw fabulous urban public spaces like Central Park that were in decline because they just hadn't really been cared for. Public space has traditionally been a hallmark of our national identity and our communities. Our country was literally built by these ideals of the national grid by Thomas Jefferson, John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt's national park system, to Frederick Law Olmsted's Central Park, and Jane Jacobs' Eyes on the Street and Ideals of Urbanism. So I think these things, while well, they're not, um, the cause and effect is complex, at least they're parallel, right? And um, it, it is ironic that uh, a generation that is maybe gotten much more interested in exercise, also doesn't do it in their everyday life. <laughs> that is a special activity in an enclosed room, often you know, plugged in and in isolation. As Dean Meyer notes, our research sought to show the parallels between specific environments or cultural landscapes and health, not causality. We're not trying to prove it. Designing healthier cultural landscapes though, we know, will require us to reinvest in our public spaces. In our contemporary U.S. context, citizens and seniors are often, more often disabled by our environment. But what we saw in these three places were seniors um, that were very enabled by their environments. They are challenged uh, and they're required to, to move uh, and be social and be physical. Uh, within the places they live. Um, not by car, but often by foot. And so we experience that firsthand, and uh, so that's a very strong component of the landscape within this place. Thanks for caring, Harry. So tell me about the hills here. One of the determinants of uh, exceptional longevity, according to us here, is the physical activity. Most people who uh, manage to uh, reach uh, a very old age here, do a lot of physical exercise uh, on very steep paths. And most people live in uh, houses uh, having uh, stairs and uh, 
we started to count the number of steps in, uh, in the stairs as an indicator of the amount of physical activity and energy expenditure on a daily basis. Quanti scale? 8, 16, 32. It turned out that uh, the number of steps uh, correlate very well with uh, some indicators of uh, well-being and of health. So in addition to the stairs that Dr. Ted mentioned, through our analysis, we found several other guidelines that designers could use to create spaces that enable physical, psychological, social, and spiritual health. So as students of landscape architecture, and now lecturers, how do we translate these lessons of longevity into design and planning decisions? I think to, to shift the conversation about public space from an amenity to a fundamental right, how it affects you biophysically, emotionally, those are qualities of the built environment that don't happen unless somebody cares about the physical environment and knows how to shape it and reconfigure it. And how can we create better communities for our parents and our children in our modern day context? So we look back in order to look forward to frame these guidelines. <laughs> <clears throat> the final analysis begins by examining processes of nature. In these places, we witness that public health and ecological health were intertwined. We, as organisms, are not separate from our environments. And so, the idea of creating an environment that itself could be described as healthy, I think, is a prerequisite uh, for us to, to live you know, healthy lives. These processes of nature are essential to reveal and to encourage people to have interactive relationships with their environments. I am so impressed with the Dell because it, for the first time, created a public space at the university that uh, fundamentally was initiated as a stormwater mitigation project. Before that, stormwater mitigation was out of sight and out of mind. So the cleaning, filtering, storing of an enormous body of rainwater is celebrated in this pond. A function of aeration occurs in the beautiful scupper and the front door to that part of the grounds. And it's an incredible uh, space of exchange between the neighborhood and the university. We need a, a multi-central immersion in, in the nature that surrounds it. We know from uh, hundreds and hundreds of studies that nature reduces stress and it improves your cognitive ability. It's a little bit like aspirin. We, we know that it works. We would never dream of not uh, uh, administering aspirin to anyone, although we, we're not quite sure how it works. And it's the same with nature. Downstream from the Dell, the City and the Nature Conservancy partnered in the rehabilitation of Meadow Creek and design a network of public trails and parklands around it. Now residents can immerse themselves in the nature within their community. A niche can be a physical gap or a social one. To fill a niche is basically the opportunistic way that humans use space to promote healthy ways of life. In Loma Linda, planners and designers have transformed unbuildable spaces like this fault line directly And because the there is a fault line running down there, they determined that all to be the green belt area. Narrow thresholds between public and private spaces empower seniors to maintain independence and healthy social network. <laughs> It creates a sense of community. It brings people to, together, uh, often in very casual contacts that are very, very healthy, the kind of things that the great urban theorist Jane Jacobs talks about as being very important for the functioning of the city. 
And we can implement strategies that empower people to make healthy decisions, like growing and purchasing local foods, and teach citizens how to grow their healthy foods independently. We're standing just above one of our largest gardens in the neighborhood of Friendship Court. It was the first one that we started. We do produce a lot of food, and we can do it collaboratively. When they work together and share the food, then they, they get to know one another, they cross some of those barriers, and they're making their, their whole community a better place to work. I think one of the most important things is it, it brings people together that normally wouldn't interact. Um, and I think there's value in the sense of, of neighborhood that they've created. It's a very interesting principle. Who has the right to the city? How much right you have to not only access but appropriate space? And it uh, filters into every design decision. Is a bench movable or not? Is it a, a material that is comfortable to sit in in the sun or not? And so there's a back and forth between design and political agency and this issue of uh, visibility. Uh, where am I allowed to appear? We should intentionally design so every member of the public is able to appropriate public space to his or her own benefits. I, I love actually um, sitting on the mall in the evening and watching the people walk by who are not shopping. They're, they're there for the act of public walking. So the downtown mall teaches us the importance of designing the experience of movement. This is the way that the body moves through space. So good design should encourage movement. The placement of the tree bosques encouraged a meandering stroll. So you realize that there's something about the spacing of thresholds, the intimacy of the street, and the amazing congestion that comes when people are gathered together doing different things. What we need today desperately is salutogenic design. It's design that actually encourages health. For example, a, a stairway that's very prominent, that's beautifully designed, that would attract your attention to use the stairs. We can design an environment that just invites us to exercise as part of our uh, daily routine. And the downtown mall is a great example of salutogenic design. There's a wonderful exposure to nature there, the, the wonderful tree canopy. It took 15 years for those beautiful willow oaks to become these enormous umbrellas that produce shade, which resulted in a rhythm of shade and light, which altered the wind patterns. You got a comfortable place to be in the summer. It has become a public health issue uh, to think about the way we design our environments so that we do give people choices uh, that allow them uh, to be more physically active. This means that seniors not only walk, but that they have somewhere to go. That they have a walking network that's more dense and safer than the automobile network. And that they feel comfortable walking because there are streets where they own the road. In regards to aging, we need to reframe our cultural narrative from getting old to growing in age or growing in wisdom. So that's why we've used the term senior. If you can fundamentally alter that template or the narrative, uh, then you have a much better chance uh, of changing attitudes. We need to design public places that are not segregated by age groups, but where seniors are vital parts of the larger social structure. Any kind of intergenerational contact, whether it's in a public space or in a healthcare facility, all these things are significant. It creates a sense of community. Lastly, and probably most importantly, we need to be bold. We can't waste time. We as designers need to forge collaborations with professionals in other disciplines. That we need uh, a generation of designers who are committed to the experimentation and the design exploration of new futures. Heart disease took my father. Okay. It's a disease that has skyrocketed with our contemporary sedentary lifestyles. And we're advocating for better design within the built environment that focuses on functional and enjoyable cities. 
built to be walkable, designed at the human scale, and interwoven with the processes of nature. The survival and success of our society depends on how we design and plan our future, and how we invest in the public places in our communities. As landscape architects, urban planners, urban citizens, or rural community members, we can choose to evolve, to experiment, to take risks, and build new futures with public space that help us live with better health as we age. Like our friends in these landscapes of longevity. I think I've just kind of lost something here. A lot of my futures. So thank you for your time today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We, uh, before we take any questions, I'd just like to thank Marsha for inviting us to be here today, and also the various organizations across grounds that allowed this project to happen, um, including the Contemplative Sciences Center, the Jefferson Area Board of Aging, the UVA Center for Design and Health, the Department of Landscape Architecture, and the Center for International Studies. Wow, thank you so much. We have, um, again, a wonderful amount of time to have some conversation back and forth. We have a pretty diverse audience and uh, also your list of um, contributing organizations shows me that in some ways we have a lot of the tools potentially already in place to do some new thinking. And so as part of this project, maybe a little bit of an extension of your project. We have a forum here that can um, talk with you and offer some ideas and get your responses. So we'll bring, uh, Colleen and I will bring mics to people who have questions so that your questions and comments go on the recording. I ask that you please um, identify yourself and where you're from um, when you make your uh, ask your question or make your comment. The floor is now open. Yes. Hi. Uh, first, you know, you? Uh, Paul Targonsky from uh, Public Health Sciences. I'm a primary care physician and epidemiologist, um, and, and I do some work in gerontology. <coughs> first of all, great job. And, and, and way, way, to, way to play your strengths to bring some additional perspective to obviously an incredibly important uh, question. So. Um, I think we've been seeing increasing traction with social determinants of health and built environment. There's the healthy county rankings and all kinds of other things that are influencing health. One of the challenges that, that we uh, continue to face is uh, engagement, is with the, uh, you know, the, the pressure of daily life, how do we encourage people to participate in uh, their health in a way that's meaningful? And useful for them and, and, and how can we do that as you mentioned across the lifespan part of what you presented really in some ways is less about longevity and more about successful aging so we know that uh, from work that we've done previously that people who are obese in their 30s have a much lower probability of not only living to be age 90 but successfully aging and having good quality of life so what what kinds of things would you be proposing that in terms of not just creating space, but creating space in such a way that you can draw people to it, and you can perhaps change some of the cultural challenges that we're facing in being engaged in our own health versus being told that other priorities are more important than that. Yeah. Sure. Well, there, uh, there are a couple of uh, ideas that I have regarding that, in case obviously jump in. Well, First, the reason that we did the project this way was hopefully to make it more engaging. Um, it goes back to this idea of, of narrative and narratology. It's not only a research method, but a way to convey um, these ideas to maybe a broader audience than uh, the healthcare community or the design community. But also, I think um, the the way to engage people is not necessarily, um, a lot of it has to do with access, and that um, the 
retirement um, systems that we have in the U.S. and um, the communities that people live in, um, so a lot of suburban developments and things like that, you can't walk to a social center from these neighborhoods. And so it's, it's not just engagement, it's just access. You wouldn't, if you live out on 29 in one of those developments, you know, you have nowhere to walk besides just around your neighborhood. And so to me, that's not um, really a public space. And then you, you can't get at um, some of these really important social components, I think, that, um, that play into that. So I think part of it has to do with kind of with doing some of that reframing about access and the way that we design and where people live. And um, yeah. So I think that there are a number of things that we look at when we examine. And you asked about proposals. Um, there, are, there are numerous ways in which we, we construct our environments. And so our, our built environment, our city here in Charlottesville, um, you know, we've, we've really started scratching the surface within our guidelines. Um, but only recently, within the last decade or so, have there been movements throughout communities in the United States to understand that um, when there's a heavy rain, how do we capture that water in a way that not only uh, prevents it from destroying the Chesapeake, but also um, can we use that rainwater, like the Dell, to create a beautiful public space where once that water was piped underground under a giant uh, concrete pipe underneath the roads. So water um, from, from the industrial age uh, to now, water has been, we've attempted to pipe it underground, get rid of it, get it off the surfaces as quickly as possible. But what we're seeing is that places like the Dell um, are, are acting like sponges for uh, an issue that we have. And we don't like to see rainwater or stormwater as an issue. We like to see that as an opportunity. And we want to, in essence, spread that message because that's one little thing. Um, another example of that is Pollock's Branch which is the creek that used to be a creek that's now piped underneath Friendship Court. And it's essentially the creek that collects most of the rainwater from the downtown mall, the downtown area. But you wouldn't know that, because that creek doesn't exist anymore because it's underground. Well, within the city of Charlottesville, there's a strategic investment area proposal that is examining what happens if we daylight that creek. And we make a beautiful public park, along with some new development, You've got pros and cons on both sides. It's a very active argument because you're going through land that was once cleared for urban renewal in the 60s and 70s. And a lot of people were um, displaced. So how do you create um, a central artery of a, of a park that is central around the watershed instead of our cities being defined by roads? So it's the little things like how wide a sidewalk is, and if you've walked maybe down um, 14th Street that turns into Madison, we used to live near Washington Park, my wife and I, we couldn't push our stroller down there to go to Boiler Heights for dinner because those sidewalks are so steep, or so uh, shallow, and because cars are whizzing by faster than 25 miles an hour. And it's not a healthy place to be. You feel stressed. And as we all know, stress is really one of these um, major contributors to all sorts of uh, negative health outcomes. So a lot of these get to ways that we can help mitigate stress on a daily basis, and that we can encourage walking on a daily basis. We can encourage bike riding on a daily basis. Um, so it's a, it's a whole host of things that um, we've really only begun to scratch the surface. Hi, uh, Matt Trowbridge uh, from the School of Medicine. And um, you know, bringing up the issue of engagement and even the last question, I think I would encourage you guys, uh, if you could have a real opportunity to engage uh, healthcare professionals and researchers. And one of the ways I was thinking about it, I was actually, one of the, the main um, quote that, was, that really struck me was that, uh, Michael, uh, Michael. Or, oh, Michael Lee. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, just in terms of um, the way we, tended to talk about built environment and health, we have to medicalize it, we have to make it medical research and health outcomes, to make it sound like it's serious and matters. Mm -hmm. We tend to treat it though as causal, um, as if uh, number, like the, the width of the sidewalk is going to somehow directly cause more footsteps and hence less calories, hence less 
What I really liked about what he said was, um, it's not so much causing a healthier life, but it is a prerequisite for a healthier life. And I think um, that's a really important opportunity for you guys. I would encourage you to keep putting, going out of your own comfort zone and talking to health researchers and understand that that's, and, and take it one more step further, I'd also encourage you to see yourself as um, arguing for case studies as a valuable research methodology rather than always large sample size. Because ultimately what you're saying is in every community there's a creek or a, a place or something special that needs to be revealed. And it's good, there isn't going to be a one size fit all. Right. So anyway, I would just keep pushing out into uh, the health world, please. That's great, thanks, Andy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alex Wolf. I'm from or, my name is Alex Wolf from the School of Nursing, and just kind of building off of what the, that gentleman was talking about. Um, right now, we're right sort of on the campus of the medical center, or close to it anyway. And there's, as in many health systems, there's a lot of construction always going on. I was just curious that based on the themes that you guys have identified in your research, um, what do you, what's your take on a lot of the construction that you've seen here? <laughs> well, I think it was, I mean, it really was us being engaged in these communities that made us realize um, that we need to be encouraged to walk. And when we actually, one of the courses we took with uh, Matthew Trowbridge uh, examined some of those buildings on campus. And um, if you are either, if, if you are, say, in one of the buildings and there's not uh, a stairway to climb on, if you're coming on a weekly basis or uh, a daily basis for treatments and you're always taking an elevator, I think that's one thing that I would critique heavily is how come in a place of health we are promoting health on a daily basis? How come there aren't ways of actively engaging stairs and climbing up and down the stairs um, that's public, that's accessible, that there uh, are places to meet colleagues if you work in that building? And, um, and so we are architects, we're landscape architects and urban planners, but that would be one of the things that I would first <coughs> critique is that there was something that was missed that was very critical um, within a lot of the buildings that, that stairways aren't celebrated. When you think of a lot of the great um, New York City architecture, for instance, you know, um, yeah, there's big, beautiful steps uh, at, the, at the library or at Grand Central or um, the old Penn Station before they tore that down. Those stairs are big and grand and beautiful. Um, we had to refrain ourselves from using the stairs for Rotunda, as an example, <laughs> but um, we, were, we were close to doing that. Yeah, but, yeah another example, um, and one of the newer uh, healthcare buildings, I will not name a name, there is a meditation garden that is not ex accessible to patients. They can just look at it. And so I, one thing that Asa and I feel very strongly about is that, is being able to immerse yourselves in these experience and experiences and not just um, be able to look at a nice, Scene, which does, which has been proven to reduce stress and things like that, but also smell and sound um, and touch are incredibly important. And so, thinking about those things when uh, we're designing gardens and um, things like that. But again, a lot of the facilities here are either well, we're looking at the facilities that people come because they're already sick. They're coming for a cure. Of most of our research is in um, is in the built environment that prevents the illness from happening. Right. So we were interested in the creation of creating a cultural landscape of preventative health. Right. That's where we started with this project. Right. Hi, I'm, I'm Deborah Heavey. I'm a psychiatrist, former pediatrician, now retired, and I see myself as approaching the next phase of my life, perhaps the final third of my life, I don't know how much longer, and I intend to stay here. 
Um, I love Charlottesville. I love what you're saying. I love your your work very much. I think I think I would stress the need to have voices from all different scenarios adding into it. Because honestly, as I listen to your extolling the stairway, I think of my achy hips, and I think of women with jaw parents with young children and prams, not prams in this country, strollers. <laughs> um, I think of going to a healthcare facility and the pediatric clinic is not that you're going to is not necessarily on the ground floor. In fact, probably isn't the teen clinic is on the ground floor. Don't ask me why teens can't walk upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, um, I think it means the practicality has to, the access, the access has to be, right. it begins with A, it has to start. The beauty, oh, look at this, the B, the beauty, is absolutely up there, but not at the expense of the access. And those huge old stairways, aren't, they, they, they daunt me. I'm not going to think about running up and down those to catch my, my trains or my planes or my classes. Or, um, so, all ages, all, all strokes, and I'm sure you do this. And don't, please don't stop, it's great. <laughs> Yeah, so th that, that's a very good point, and we're definitely not suggesting that we eliminate elevators <laughs> entirely. Um, this is, for me at least, one of my interests coming off of this project is thinking about how architects and landscape architects can reframe universal design, and so that it's not just the way it is now is a lot of in a lot of cases is that it ends up being kind of the lowest common denominator. You have to have an eight percent ramp for a wheelchair kind of thing, and we don't think about how these places could actually be designed <coughs> with both stairs and elevators, or as a way um, of not just designing for the disability itself. Uh, and so I think that's that's definitely a step where that needs more research um, and there's um, there's been you know some incredible um, case studies that I've been looking at in terms of um, prosthetics and furniture design and things like that that I actually think could really be applied to landscape architecture and architecture um, but for as Asa mentioned for this project we were thinking about enabling environments preventative and not um, this not your question or your point incredibly important it's just something we kind of reached at the end of our analysis and too in Sardinia um, numerous people it wasn't just Giovanni uh, in their 80s and 90s they live in these houses where they have to walk up the stairs they don't have a choice and so um, you know, for, it is very preventative. In Okinawa, like, like the rest of Japan, they sit on the floor. And so we sat on the floor and had dinner and tea. And I mean, I'm, I'm 33 and sitting on the floor with my baby is like, ah, oh, it's creaky. But I need to do that <laughs> more and more because otherwise I'm just, you know, I'm going to turn into somebody that drives everywhere because I'm, it, it makes me lazy. But that's what these narratives are trying to show is that um, Shirley Bozinski, who was sniffing the flowers, she was 72 when she broke her leg and fell off a, 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 a ladder. A ladder. Uh, and here she's 76 and she's jogging. And so that's another narrative that helps me when I'm you know, feeling real sorry for myself about working out, I think about Shirley Bozinski. <laughs> and so in a way, the narratives also serve another purpose, which is sharing with, with us and inspiring us to in spite of the aches and the creeks, to take the stairs today. And that's what's really going to you know, help you live a fuller, longer, another third of your life, at least in my opinion. I do walk two miles every night. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Hello, um, Mary Ann Yankin. I'm working in environmental health and safety uh, department, with health on my side of what we do. Um, and having just moved to Charlottesville um, from Australia and then before that the West Coast, there's not things are really close in Charlottesville. It doesn't take, you know, things are pretty close. I've never seen so many vehicles, so many cars, people getting around with cars. Have you been in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, so in terms of like biking options. So I was wondering from your experience in your studies, case case studies or cities that you've heard about, what's it take for a city to turn 
turn that around for their community to start introducing the idea of how easy it would be to hop on your bike. I can get to work in 12 minutes if I drive, 26 minutes if I pedal. Much better to pedal. Maybe less stressed when I get there, but I can't get through the mud and schluck, you know? <laughs> so any, any cities that you can talk about or other situations? Well, Charlottesville, um, they're, they're going through a major uh, bike and pedestrian plan right now. And Charlottesville actually, in comparison to many other uh, American cities, uh, gets a decent thumbs up. But overall, in the United States, the number of people that bike, are, that bike before their commute is in the you know, 5 to 8 range, 5% to 8%. Whereas, you know, of course, uh, from living abroad, you know that in Europe, it's in the 40s. And so there is a density issue, but within the city of Charlottesville, they're, they're constantly having meetings about it. And there's probably something on the front page of Charlottesville Tomorrow, which is a great hyper-local website that really examines built environment issues, um, especially uh, you know, the biking issues. And so the city has a really nice plan that they're trying to implement to make Charlottesville even more bike friendly. Yeah, and uh, cities like Portland, Oregon has done great job, Portland's always our like urban planning, landscape architecture case study, uh, but it's really, I mean, it's a culture there, yes, but also they have um, really worked with the infrastructure of the city so that they have streets that are just bicycle streets, they have, is it, I want to say it's Portland, but I'm not positive, there's a city out there where they are building are having a bridge that's going to be just a bike head bridge for commuters. Um, yeah. I have to stop. Like, just the one quick question I want to say: Whenever people bring up Portland, though, they always talk about it the way it is now, as if it's this like. And I, what I, I, I know you know this. I want to make sure it's always part of the dialogue. Your question was, how do cities do this? Portland in 1980 was not a, a biking mecca. It looked a lot like most cities. They made very careful deliberate policies and strategies over the course of time and then you reach a tipping point and then suddenly it becomes so that way the culture changes and now there's now people move to Portland to be part of that and that starts reinforcing itself. We can do that here. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, one more quick question. Um, I'm Catherine Simmons, I'm from the School of Medicine, and I guess what I was trying, what I was going to ask is kind of hinting off of what the last question was. Um, I used to live in Harrisonburg, and at one time I got this great idea that I was going to walk to work, so I work downtown, and then I live near JMU, and um, so I just started walking to work, and then after about a week or two I had to stop because like my coworkers and people that I knew would see me walking down the street, would assume that I didn't have a ride or that my car was broken down and they were offering help. And after about three or four times of saying, no, that's okay, I'm just, you know, walking to work, I eventually abandoned the idea and I just started driving after that because it just got to be too much of a, of a pain or a hassle. And so now I look around and I realize, you know, most of the people that you see walking, or especially not in Charlottesville, but in other areas, they are walking because they don't have transportation because they have you know, whatever to you, I don't have a license or whatever, and it's like a social thing, like if, you know, if you have a car, then you're seen to be a little bit more prosperous. So I'm wondering, how do you change the attitude to make it more acceptable for people to be able to bike to work or walk? Well, I think, I, for, for us, it's like, you know, this has a lot to do with the, the framework or lens that we use when starting off this project we mentioned earlier, which is the cultural landscape perspective. And so from our point of view, they're um, symbiotic or mutually reinforcing, where if you change the landscape to be amenable to these sorts of things, then the culture will begin to shift. And then when the culture shifts, then there will be more landscape shifts that will begin to bring bring out this environment more. And that's kind of what Matt was mentioning happened in Portland. And we're seeing it in Charlottesville. It's better now than it used to be, definitely. Um, but we have a lot of strides to go. So it's, um, you know, it's having a 
maybe more people like you that are willing to watch work. One summer I was interning downtown and would walk every day. It was like a 30 minute walk and I had the same experience. People would stop me all the time be like, do you need a ride? I'm like, no, I'm fine.